This is Nate Staniforth. You're listening to the Successful Mentalist Podcast. Oh, hello and welcome. This is uh, a conversation that has, has come up fairly quickly, but I'm genuinely incredibly uh, excited about. Today, we are talking to one of my favorite uh, minds in all of magic. I, I, I can't pinpoint him to a creator, a thinker, or anything. I don't want to use one of those coined terms, but today we're talking with the incredible Nate Staniforth. Nate, I just want to jump in and just say thank you so much for A, taking the time to be here. I know that your, your wonderful world, you're very distanced from the, the magic community for creative reasons. Hopefully we can actually touch on that because that'd be particularly interesting. But I just wanted to say first off, thanks for actually coming on and spending the time with us here. It's, it genuinely means a lot. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me on. Now, here's the thing, Nate. You've recently, you've just launched an incredible podcast. I feel bad for calling it a podcast uh, because it isn't. It's like a full auditory experience. Genuinely, it's it's far more polished than any TSM podcast episode is or ever will be, uh, truth be told. But it's called Everything But The Flame. And I wanted to just jump straight in at the deep end and, and see if you could happily share us the the reason behind Everything But The Flame as the title, that little story, if that's okay. Sure. So a number of years ago, I was in Paris, just walking around with some friends. And I, I came upon this artist who was was just doing a sketch. He had his, his drawing stand set up in this, I don't know, just on the side of the street. But he was drawing this this picture of a man sitting at a table, staring into the the flame of a candle. And I just stood there and, and watched him work for a few minutes. And and the way he set up his drawing, the the focal point, the 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 place your eye was drawn to, the thing, the 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 center of the picture was the white hot center of the flame. But as as I watched him work, I realized that he never he never drew the white hot center of the flame. He drew everything else. He drew the man and the shadow of the man on the table and the wall and the candlestick. You know, he, he filled in everything else, but he left the white hot center blank because how, how do you draw something? You know, you can't, you can't with a black pencil, you can't draw that any better than just, just leaving a blank. And, and so as I was standing there watching him, I, I thought, this is the perfect metaphor for what I'm trying to do as a magician because I can't show you real magic, but I am trying to show you real magic, right? I don't have magic powers, but I'm trying to give you the experience of watching real magic. And so I thought if if you could do it, if you could handle yourself as a magician in the way that this artist was approaching his picture and draw everything but the flame, if you arrange all of the elements in your performance in such a way that the experience of real magic can come through, it, that would be a way of of sharing the unshareable or showing the unshowable to an audience. And and it's just it's been a really sort of practical guideline for me as I as I write new scripts or as I think about new routines or as I put a show together to to not get hung up on the, the way to share real magic with an audience is to not try to show it to them but to show them everything else and to let them find it on their own it's incredible it's, it's such an it's such an opposite approach to traditional magic thinking it, it, for i don't know about yourself but like 90 percent of the magic world from my experience has been focused on the trick the method making the magic more deceptive by making usually the method more complicated and, and that's the extent of what it is and just trying to make the trick a bit better but what we're saying here and what we're starting with in the whole cinch point of, of everything but the flame is well let's paint around that let's paint everything else around the picture and, and which is far more fun that's a that's a, a bigger game i think you, you've said it beautifully when you said that the show isn't um it isn't about just becoming a better magician it's about becoming a better artist sure yeah and if you do that you'll become a better magician Th those two go together uh, but it's just so easy to i mean the the central premise of the show is that technical advancement um, can only take you so far that most magicians don't need better techniques. They need bigger dreams and a, and a bigger, clearer vision of what they're trying to achieve on stage. And 
And and you can improve by working on your double lift, but you can also improve by really understanding what you're trying to accomplish with the double lift and what you're trying to give to the audience. Yeah. And it's that deeper thinking and the the further thoughts that you have behind your art, Nate, which honestly we've seen some of your performances and it takes it like out of the world like to watch just the briefest of videos online or the longest of videos online or when you're in a theater on a street everyone is so captivated but it's because you're doing this I, I don't say this to put the smile on your face I say this because I genuinely mean it Nate um but it is and I, I, I really like understand that uh, you just take your art so much further and what you said and, and this was in I believe episode one the first episode describing it when you was talking about that kind of analogy it made me think about like the own way I perform when I've looked at my own performances and when I've presented it when I've just been so direct like this is what I'm doing blah 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 I'm firing it away like that and then just presenting the tricks and giving them everything it's not hit as hard as when I've just held back some of the information and it suddenly just clicked in my mind like after listening to that episode I was like oh my gosh that's exactly and and it's really helped me in my own career just like actually have stronger magic and like a stronger presentation because before I was literally just going home and said this is it this is it this is it this is it is that makes sense and now it's just like that little bit is just held back and it really is painting like the journey just around the edges and people are just so much more captivated and and it's genuinely helped me so much so glad to hear that yeah one one of the one of the rules that i made for myself going into this project was that it couldn't be theory for theory's sake or ideas just for the sake of having ideas that it had to be something you could put in the work right away otherwise who cares you know that i i want i want my magic to be as strong as possible and one of the things I've discovered is that clear thinking leads to clear performances and clear performances are just stronger than muddled performances. And so I, I know it sounds counterintuitive to, to say, I'm going to improve my magic by not working on my magic, by working on all of the stuff that goes around it. But, um, but my experience is, has been that it's the same thing, that it all works together towards creating a stronger moment for your spectators. Of this, I think when we last saw each other in person pre chaos, uh, there was a phrase that you used to describe the the concept associated with like visioning good magic and actually seeing what it was. And, and the phrase you used again, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was this concept of we need to make our magic more biblical. Oh God, I, I don't remember saying that at all. <laughs> but but you know when like I think of my favorite magicians. Uh, my favorite magician in the history of magic is David Burglass. And when you look at the magic he performed, it, it very rarely is on a small, trivial scale. He put himself in the lion's den. He stopped traffic on Piccadilly Circus. He, you know, his, his dreams were just bigger than most other magicians and, and his plots were bolder and, 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 and just sort of legendary. It, even just the story of them is legendary and that always fit so much more closely with what I think of when I think of an experience that would be magical than, than does the latest variation of a variation of the second phase of a thing Marlowe showed Vernon one night, you know, like it's just, it, it's on a, it's on a different scale. And I, I really admire that scale. So can I ask you a really direct question then, if, if that's all right? Of course. Obviously, you've put a lot of work and a lot of thought into actually looking into what is magic and I'll say what is like real magic, kind of similar to the name on your book. And like you've you've gone and explored India, you've done like incredible shows. I think you've said on your podcast, what is it, like 2,500 shows you've now done? And you've put so much work into this and, and your knowledge that you've developed over the time is profound. What do you reckon is the biggest problem with magic nowadays in the way that it's presented? Oh, I, I don't know how to speak to the magic community at large. I, I have to also tell you, I don't watch any magic. I live in a, in a rural and mostly isolated part of the United States. 
And I love it. I love that I'm the only magician out here. I love that I'm not part of, I'm not, I'm not having to constantly grapple with other people's visions of what magic could be because it's hard enough. It's hard enough for me to do what I'm trying to do. I can't imagine having to constantly sort of match myself up against everybody else. And so I have very deliberately turned my, um, turned my gaze, turned my attention away from what everybody else is doing just so I can have a fighting chance to bring what I'm trying to bring to life, to life. So my only answer is, is, um, it, it relates to my work and what I'm trying to do. Um, and, and the problem that I have now is the problem that I've always had that, that if, it's not one of vision, it's one of execution. If I could make the audience feel about the material the way I feel about it, they would never forget it. It would it would set their head on fire, you know, that it would change their life forever. And I know that because it's changed my life forever. That that if if I could just perfectly translate the experience that I have in my imagination to the audience's imagination, it, that'd be it. It'd be it'd be a sensation. And I know that I'm not there. I know that I'm not getting it. And, and so every show becomes an attempt at doing that. And I, I don't know. I, I hope I get there someday, but I'm not there yet. I think there's, there's many people like running TSM. We get the beautiful advantage of being able to meet a lot of entertainers from all different walks of life. Hey, the podcast has had listens in over 105 countries worldwide right now. It's genuinely incredible the amount of people that we're that we're seeing. But I, I don't say this because you're in front of me, but I say this because it, I, I believe it. I would argue that you're the most passionate artist I think I've ever met. And I, I'd just love to to know from your perspective, what is the role of passion in magic for you? Oh. I I don't know how to answer that. I I don't really have another context. You know, I, I can only see it from my perspective. I I don't I never chose to be a magician. As long as I can remember, it's only it's felt like the only option. Like this is uh, like I am I am made for this and this is made for me. Like you know, we just we we belong together. I can't imagine not being a magician. And so you know, I think once you know what you want to do, you just do it as hard as you can. And, and I, that's, that's the only way I've ever been alive, right? Like I, this, is, this is my understanding of what it is to be a human being, that, that I am here trying to do this as well as I can. And I, so I, I don't know how to talk about passion. It's not something I've tried to foster or create. It's just the way I am. You know, I'm sort of a strange dude <laughs> because for as long as I can remember, I would rather work on this than I would do just about anything else. And and all of the other things that I do outside of magic, I'm a writer and a musician and I'm interested in photography and, and all of that, all of that circles back. It's just a different, it's, it's an extension of what I'm trying to do as a magician, just using different tools. So I, I'd, I don't, I honestly don't know how to answer the question. It's just, I was born this way and I'm just grateful that I found magic at such a young age because I don't, I don't know what I'd be doing otherwise. So is the, the question more relating to, to the subject of creativity then in and of itself, more, more so than passion. It's, it's, you found the, the clicking point, the point that see, that works to you, like you and magic have connected as as with many people like it connects it's just there there's no other way around it but being able to find that way of demonstrating magic in any form like what same question but replacing passion with creativity what is the role of of creativity on sure. magic and, and, and yourself as well yeah i mean i think I, i've always felt like i i think i'm good at something I don't think it's magic. I think whatever I think whatever it is that I'm trying to do is adjacent to the craft of magic, but it's not really the same thing. And so so much of my show 
I, I, you know, I think it probably looks different than the standard magic show, but that's not because I'm trying to be different. I'm just trying to do this thing that I'm imagining and, and hijacking the craft of magic to, to use it for my own ends. So I don't think here, here it is. Let me say it more directly. I think a lot of magicians want to bring more creativity to their work and, and maybe wonder how to do that. And I think that's, I think that's approaching it backwards. I think if you just spend some time thinking about what it is, what do you like? Like, what are you trying to make here? You've, you've spent so much time learning all these skills and all these techniques and mastering these routines. Why? Like what, what are you looking for? And then make your work about that. And and if you do, if if your work then becomes about pursuing that 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 vision, you will necessarily, you will inevitably end up finding some unusual or we could say creative approaches to getting there because you'll be trying to solve a problem that no one else is trying to solve. I think the problem with starting with the goal of creativity is that you're incentivized to be different just for the sake of being different. But, but if you just sit down and spend an hour or a day or a week or a month or, or, you know, whatever it is, understanding why you're here and what you're looking for, then, then your work becomes about that, about trying to get there. And, and the creativity part comes all on its own. Can, can I, can I maybe make that more practical? Can I just tack something on the end of it that, that your listeners today. One thing that's been really useful to me is, is starting an ongoing journal. It's a file on my laptop. I write in it. Sometimes I write in it every day. Sometimes it's every week. Um, the, you know, it, my attention to this document um, waxes and wanes, but, but it, it's a journal about my thoughts on magic and wonder and astonishment and, and the craft and the art of, of, being a magician and and the goal is not to it's not an academic exercise it's just a place for me to sort of uh to to write free form to find out what i think about these things there's a there's a quote by a writer and I'm, i don't remember her name but she said something like i write about i write to discover what i think and and i love that i love that uh idea that by sitting down and journaling about magic or about your work as a magician or a mentalist, you can discover what your tastes are, what your preferences are, what your ideals, your aspirations, or, or just your vision of what it should look like. And, and giving yourself a place to do that deliberately rather than just waiting for inspiration to strike ha has been really useful to me. It's become as important as you know, the, the shelf of magic books that I have that teach me the technique. Um, you can learn technique from other magicians, but you can't, no one can have your dreams for you. You have to do that on your own. And, and, and starting a journal about magic is a way to, to, to make that sort of a systemic practice rather than one that you just, you know, wait to have it occur to you um, in a flash of inspiration. I love that. I think one of the one of the big things. Um, so, so for a, a side note, and it, it'll loop round and make sense in a second. Um, are, are you familiar with like Maslow's hierarchy of needs? That concept. Yeah. Um, a, a little fun fact, a bit of trivia for anybody anybody listening. It was never drawn as a pyramid by Maslow. It was uh, he never drew. It. it was a management textbook that basically saw the concept and turned it into a pyramid so that they'd have something that would look good in the textbook um which i just thought was incredible but um the concept up there of there um, uh scott barry kaufman um was my mentor for a little while he wrote the book transcend and it's basically a reworking and, and a modernized version and a real deep dive on maslow's hierarchy and he puts it as more of a sailboat where you the actual structure of the boat is actually building those security needs and those baseline needs. And then up the top, we've got the exploration. We've got things like creativity as being not only important, but fundamental for our growth and for our own journey. And actually having the, the practices there, it's, it's a really, um, whenever I talk to people about this kind of stuff, it's what is opening the sails? 
what what is actually what activities can we do to open the the sales on creativity um and i just wanted to make that that simple connection because i think it goes much more than just chasing magic i, I think it goes to chasing a, like us right it goes to chasing the truest form of ourselves and what we believe in does magic your vision of magic connect to you in that way does it does it connect to you as you or is it something different oh for sure yeah it's why it's why the shows i mean i i don't know how you feel about performing for me it's this i don't know it feels like this deeply personal um weighty and significant attempt to share this thing that i desperately want to share with an audience and and it's just hateful you know i i am just inconsolable before a show I, you know, as you mentioned, I've done a lot of performances and I still get, I don't know if stage fright is so much the, the, the word is just existential dread that, that I, I'm not going to be able to share this thing that I, I, I feel so desperately that I need to share. Um, but, but yeah. And to, to your question immediately. Yes. I think, I think that if you're, if you are, if you're as an artist pursuing something that matters to you and you know performing it on stage for an audience that is invariably a personal experience and and it's it's one of the reasons that bad shows are so hard because it doesn't just feel like a professional failing it feels like a personal failing and so um I, yeah i think that's one of the reasons maybe i uh, approach it so rigorously because i just hate the feeling of a bad show so i would rather um, over prepare than than under prepare. Yeah, that's fascinating. There was one thing. Um, this this is uh, completely reminded me of uh, on your podcast, everything but the flame. Uh, in one of the episodes, you speak a little about about creativity and actually following other passions outside of magic. And this is something which really stood out. You said some of the greatest performers and greatest people around are also doing other creative things. You gave the example of Darren and his paintings and his photography and his writing, for example, when Teller with obviously the playwriting, the great Andy Nyman and other people like that. And you mentioned how important it is to follow other creative passions outside of magic. Like we can talk to Aiden about the benefits of like obviously flow states and the neurobiology behind that. <laughs> that guy over there is a genius when it comes to that. But I really want to know like, People get so caught up in their hobby and when they make it and turn it into a job, then it can very, very quickly soon become a job that they resent. And and for me, at least, finding another passion, finding another hobby outside, it really helps support that so that it never becomes something that eventually after three years will just dwindle and just be like, oh, well, this sucks. Can I ask just like, maybe someone struggling or not really realizing that they need to find something else or another creative pursuit to help them where would they go to do that how do they find something else that they like doing like magic is the one thing that's drawn to them that they love more than anything in the world and they're not really sure like if there's anything else that they like doing because like magic seems to be everything so how, how do they find something else yeah i mean i again i can only speak to my experience but i i I'm just curious about so many things. Uh, you know, I listen to a song and I, I want to figure out how they made that song. And maybe the best way to do that is to learn to play the guitar and the drum, you know, like to just to, 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 to find the things you love and then think about how you would make something in that medium. Um, but I think also you can just play around and try things out. You know, you can, um, take pictures with your camera you can uh, writing is free you don't need any equipment you can just start and and see what you think i think exploration is is the main thing that that you're not waiting for something to strike you um you're you're going out and trying different things and having new experiences and pushing yourself beyond your typical day-to-day -day existence to discover what else is out there and what what else you like i think i certainly understand feeling like magic is all that you need and all that you you know there's so much to explore as a magician 
that that you could spend an entire lifetime learning new techniques and new tricks and and new ways of thinking about magic. And there's nothing wrong with that. But at least for me, I, I felt like I hit this point where none of the new techniques I was learning were actually changing where I was at as a magician, right? Like if you think about where you are with your magic now and compare it to where you were a month ago, it's probably about the same, right? Or maybe even two months ago or maybe even a year ago or two years ago, right? Like magic is set up in such a way that um, it, it, it's easy to just make slow incre incremental progress, which is fine. Again, there's nothing wrong with that. But my argument is by taking on a different creative field, by by trying to learn what you can about making songs or making paintings or making photographs, you will discover new parts of yourself that you can then bring to your work as a magician and, and, and your work as a magician will grow. It's not that you're becoming a photographer so you can leave magic and, and pursue photography forever. You're, you're just allowing your creative capacities that maybe have gone unused in magic to flourish and grow so that you can, you can then bring them back to your magic. Oh, this is, this is interesting because the amount of people that we talk to, um, especially early doors when they're looking and starting to do paid work and, 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 and then on the other side of things, we get people that are deep in the trenches, I think is the common, common phrase uh, in the trenches of doing gigs after gigs, after gigs, they, they tend to have this whole, this this same overlapping thing that I think Ashley mentioned there in terms of uh, magic is a job, and and magic is a job as a sort of a resentful thing for the people that are in the weeds, but also a a fear for the people that are about to take the leap or about to start dipping their toe into the water of, of paid professional work. And I, I'd, I'd just love to know is doing the performances, doing the shows, the official events, the the, the paid work, has that had an impact? on a your approach to magic or, or b like your thoughts towards magic i know they may be one and the same but sure. yeah i mean i i started touring as a professional magician the summer i turned 22 uh, and and i went really hard for five years and then got so burnt out that i walked off stage in the middle of a show and bought a ticket to the other side of the world, not really knowing if I was ever going to come back to the world of professional magic again. And so I understand. I, I, I have been there um, before, you know, before feeling burnt out and disillusioned and disappointed with, with the experience of being a professional magician. I think one thing that's hard is, is that, you know, you get into magic at least for me, thinking of it as this high, lofty, idealistic pursuit, and then you're hired as like an entertainer at someone's cocktail party, and and that's a different thing. It's not like your a magician's work is featured in an art museum. It's you're right there next to the string quartet and the guy serving cocktail shrimp on a platter, walking around, and and it can be hard to feel great about about taking this thing you love and putting it in the service industry. So I, uh, I, I look, I, I have been there many times and, and have felt that, um, that disappointment and that, that sense of, is this really it? Is this how I'm going to spend my life um, as, a, as a hired entertainer for, for corporate holiday parties, right? Um, but, but here's the thing. I think, I think, if if your pursuit of of success in magic is about the success, is about breaking into a certain um, tier of, um, in, in maybe making the jump from corporate shows to theater shows, or or if if you are trying to, if you're thinking I'm going to work as an entertainer now, so later I can be an artist. I think you'll run into that frustration again and again and again. The breakthrough for me was realizing that you don't have to wait, that the people who are at these cocktail parties or at these corporate events, those are people too. And just because they're not sitting in a Broadway theater 
watching you on stage doesn't mean that they deserve any less from you as an artist, that, that they are still uh, thoughtful and intelligent and curious people, even though they've been, you know, forced to attend this, <laughs> this holiday party. And, and th the result is that, I, so the thing I'm excited about now is, is thinking about how I can be the best artist I can be, even when I'm doing holiday parties, even when I'm doing corporate work. You know, we're recording this in December, which is a crazy time for magicians and mentalists because every corporation in the world is throwing holiday parties right now. And, and the, the challenge that has been useful to me is asking myself, not how can I endure this so I can then move on to something better later on, but how can I make the work that I want to make in this environment for these people? Because that's the audience that I have right now. And what a shame it would be what a shame it would be to wait an entire lifetime for things to to go in a different direction and to never once make the work that you want to make. Just just make it where you are for whatever audience that will listen to you. And if that means a Broadway theater, great. And if that means you know you're standing on a dining hall table at some college and performing for undergraduate students, you know that's great. Where wherever you are, just just bring the best, create the best art that you can. And, and, and that, that is ultimately so much less disappointing than feeling like you're, you're using whatever shows you have just as a means to an end. That was a convoluted answer, but, but I think I touched on all of the points eventually. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. It makes complete sense. I think what's particularly interesting about uh, so for, if anybody's not watched any of your clips on YouTube, for example, um, genuine, genuinely fantastic and highly worth a watch. Um, what I love about your magic is that it's just so pure in the sense of it's not full of convoluted approaches. It's not full of of chaos. It's not. In fact, I watched um, literally just last night. I watched. Um, Piff the Magic Dragon went back on Fool Us a second time. And the whole concept of that routine was that it's going to be the most convoluted and chaotic crisis. It's really worth a watch. It's so funny. Um, but it's absolutely chaos and there's there's everything everywhere to get to essentially one trick. But your approach to magic or from what we've seen on, on YouTube, for example, and it's very it's very the opposite. It's we're going to go from A to B. Yeah. And that's it. What what made you want to go from A to straight B? I, I, aside from it perhaps being the most direct version of, of what magic means to you, what made you want to go from A to B rather than detours or Piff the Magic Dragon craziness kind of stuff? I think one thing I think about, about a lot as a, as a performer is the difference between Okay, so so there are two ways to think about this is reductive, but but there are these two ways of thinking about a show. One is that your job is to perform the set list that you have planned for your audience and fill your time, right? So if you're hired to do an hour show, the job can be my job is to do these five tricks in an hour and give the audience a show. The other way of thinking about it is my job is to give the audience this experience that I, I'm trying to get them to the place where I want to go. I have an hour to get there. What am I going to do to, to take them on that, take them on that journey to, to take them from where we are at the beginning of the show to the place that I want to go with them. And, and I have found that the second way is far more satisfying. It, it, there's a difference between technically completing your obligations and and creating the thing that you wanted to create in front of an audience and and so i have found that the most effective way for me to do what i'm trying to do as an artist is to just as you say go from a to b and to not to to cut away all of the extraneous elements so that the audience can really feel the piece that I want them to feel. 
and and everything in the show is in the service of that transition from A to B. That's just the way that works best for me. Someone with a different vision of magic or of mentalism or of performing would would make totally different choices. I think Piff is a genius. I I, I love what he does. I couldn't pull that off. I would look ridiculous trying to do that. I'm glad he's doing it. Um, but you know, I think you just find what works for you and and double down on that rather than trying to do everything. But how did you go through that process to find what works for you and to find more importantly what you want to do and how you want to convey this and the fact that you just want to go from A to B? Like how did you come to that realization and and find that out? There's a quote um that Churchill had of the Americans. He said the Americans always do the right thing after trying all of the wrong things first. I, I butchered that, but but it, that, that's the idea that you you find the right way of doing it by just experimenting. I, I've done I've done a great number of terrible shows, and all of those terrible shows have taught me something about what goes into a good show and and what you know. I, I think it's hard. It's hard to um, overemphasize the importance of just spending as much time sincerely trying to share what you're trying to share with an audience, because you will discover what works and what doesn't. It's one of the things, I, I, you know, I think there's a great debate in magic and mentalism about scripting. Should you script everything? And, and I think I, I have found that the version of myself that can sit down and write a script is different than the version of myself that that can deliver it and i have never had success writing a script ahead of time and then bringing that to life on stage my show is scripted word for word but that has come from thousands of attempts at sincerely communicating something organically and then learning what words work and what what ideas are worth conveying at a certain time. So it's something you find rather than something that you you plan ahead of time, at least for me. The, the, bad, shows, the bad shows are interesting. And, and you, you spoke uh, to the role of failure. Actually, you, you gave the, the, the wonderful example. I love the story in your, in your podcast about the, uh, the Houdini escape or, or, or mild lack thereof. Um, uh, but the but the point in case being, I'd love you to touch on that story if that's okay. Um, but the but the point in case being, that failure is not a bad thing. Like the bad shows, yes, they help the learning point. But but could could you talk to to the role of failure? Yeah, I mean, I think it's essential. I think if if I could prescribe one, you you know, one assignment that would help any magician become better, it would be see if you can see if you can um, rack up a few spectacular disasters in front of an audience because what happens is you you realize that it doesn't matter that they forget you and you learn so much that that you develop this sort of fearlessness because you know that you can go out on stage and whatever happens you will be okay and that frees you to to really be present in the moment and to not feel like you have to impress the audience at every moment to, to focus on giving them what you're trying to give them rather than simply pleasing them at every, every step along the way. And, it, you know, I, I've had some spectacular disasters as a performer and none of them are comfortable in the moment. It's always awful, but in hindsight, I have learned so much from those moments where things have gone badly that I, I wouldn't trade them for anything. So do you have a process for dealing with failure and how you can maximize like the learning off the back of it? I don't. I should. It's a good idea. <laughs> well, it might, it might be. <laughs> no one knows. <laughs> no one knows. Well, I, fa failure is so... I find failure fun. Um I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm, I think about it the wrong way, but I find it quite fun. There was a, a show I did a few years back and um, the, the long and short of it is that there's a routine that takes between 
20 and 30 minutes to complete the full routine. And, and there's no reveals, no magical big grand finales until the end. And in that last sort of two minutes, there's like six or seven punch after punch after punch. It's, it's genuinely, I love it. It's fantastic, but it was supposed to end the first half of my show. And I, I'll be honest and say that there's, a, there's two methods in the whole thing and they're really easy. I got to the end of the first half of this, this, uh, the show. And I'd messed up one of the two methods and the whole whole thing came crumbling down. There's no half of it, everything. It was chaos and everyone was right. Wait, there was music, hype music in the back. It was just, it was terrible. And my, my thought was ditched it to the audience. I went out for, for the interval and the audience went off again. Fine. But I, I reset the routine backstage ready to re, like put it back in again. This 20, 30 minutes for the second half of the show. Anyway, the second half of the show comes and we get through, we go, we replow through. Everyone knows where it's going, the whole thing, every step of the process, the whole journey. And we got to the, got to the end and I messed up the other method. And it was the, it was the worst feeling in the world, but the two, and they're basic. Like it's a dice switch and turning over a notepad. That's it. That wasn't, it's not even hard. It's no, not even technical, but ruined the whole thing twice. So that was like 40, 40, 50 minutes of drive to nothing. Um, anyway, the, 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 the point in case being is that that double failure, as you said, like spectacular fails early on, they, they do so much and, and, in the fairest way possible. I, I just don't do that routine anymore, but <laughs> maybe that had to be the learning. Um, I, the, there was a point, but I mean, you discover that even if the audience, even if they're not understanding, even if they hate you, the show ends and they go their way and you go your way and you're fine and you're all right. And now you have this secret, hidden layer of armor under your shirt the next time you walk out to perform because you know that no matter what happens it won't be bad as that last time where you you know botched the the same trick twice in the same show and and so so that 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 gives you a sort of confidence and a sort of uh sense of invulnerability that no matter what happens it it won't be as bad as the last time and if it is still you'll be okay you know Maybe you had then another disaster, and then you get this the second layer of armor, and you know that okay, well the next time I go out, and 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 so over time you you develop this, you you develop this realization that audiences forget the bad shows they've seen and they remember the great ones, and that that here it is that fearlessness with the occasional disaster will lead to more interesting work than safe tepid unchallenging success uh every, every time that's my bet anyway i i hope it works out this reminds me of something that we were speaking about the other day and you, you went for a coffee with another performer and uh and he was saying to you that in every show that he does to keep the the passion alive to keep the the interest alive for him he always puts in one new routine which is not actually done before it's like a little practice because he finds that fun and now it's exciting and then it's just not the same show over and over and over and over again and i suppose it kind of links into that as well i love it. what a what a clever way of keeping the show fresh and vibrant is there is there any like I'm conscious of time here, so, and I don't want to don't want to keep because we could talk for hours on all of this stuff quite quite easily. Uh, but is is there anything that you do in particular that keeps the, the, I, I don't want to say the magic alive because that's a, a cliche and not relevant, but but keeps that that risk there. Oh, I wish I had a better answer for you. It every show feels like a risk for me. You know, I think, I think, you know, for me, it all, for me, the entire purpose of doing a show is to find a way to share this experience with an audience that, that I'm trying to give them. And I, I, I just love how 
different every audience is. And I love how you could be in the same venue with two different nights and one group of people just feels like a different group of people or feels that it feels different. Your audience on a Wednesday night will feel different than your audience on a Thursday night. And, and I love the challenge that comes from trying to meet them where they are and take them where I want to go. So it's not, I, I don't have a, I don't, I don't have a practice to keep that fresh. It just sort of is fresh already when, when your goal isn't to just do your show, but to actually take people on the, for, uh, to take people on this journey from point A to point B, then, then there's a, a, a mission to the performance or there's a sense of purpose that, that isn't there if you're just trying to get through your, your time. I love that. And Nate, I just want to say thank you so much again for for jumping on board and and actually having this conversation with us. Genuinely, an absolute pleasure. But before we before we wrap things up, where can people find out more about you, your work, and and, and what it is that you've got going on? Yeah, first, uh, I think what you guys are doing on this podcast is amazing. I wish I had this 15 years ago when I was just starting as a performer. It's it's such a great resource. Um. I'm thrilled to be a part of it. So thank you for having me on. Uh, if you have listened to this podcast and you can stand to hear more of me talking, uh, my podcast is called Everything But The Flame. You can find it wherever podcasts are are offered. And that's that's probably the best place. That's the thing that, that's the next step if people want to hear more. Perfect. And is there a final thought or message that you'd like to leave the entire audience of TSM? No, just good luck. I mean, it this is such a hard I think I think it's easy to overlook how difficult it is to do magic or mentalism well. I admire anybody who has taken this on in a serious way and is trying to do it. So just good luck and keep at it and and uh, I wish everyone the most success and and the most growth in this as they can find.